Thank you all so much for joining today. My name is Lydia Holmes. I'm the Director of Industry Affairs and Sustainability for USA Rice. We're very excited to have you all here today virtually to make a very important announcement for our industry. Like many things right now, um, this is unprecedented for us. It's new. Um, we've never done a virtual press conference before. And so please be patient with us and our speakers as we work through any technical difficulties that we may have, hopefully we won't. Um, we are recording this session. So if for any reason we get cut off, a recording of this will be sent to you so you'll have access to the content either way. So you may or may not have used Zoom before and there are lots of these platforms. So I'm actually gonna go through a couple of the features just to, to make this go a little bit more smoothly for you, especially if there are features that maybe I haven't used in Zoom before. So when you logged on, you might have seen a lot of different videos or a bunch of boxes with names on the right-hand side of your screen or at the top. So if you wanna go hover over that panel, there are actually a few options at the top of that box. The far left, there's a dash. That'll minimize all of the videos. The one next to it is active speaker view. If you click that, it'll only show the person that's speaking right now. We would recommend that um, having just the speaker box up there in order to best see the slides and be easiest for you. But if you change that view, it only changes it on your screen. So it's up to you on what, um, what works best for you. The other feature I'll point out um, when we get to the question and answer portion of the press conference at the end, we're going to be using the hand raise feature or the chat box. So if you go to the bottom of your screen and hover, you should see a few things pop up. So one of them says participants and it's got a little number next to it. If you click on that, you'll see a list of all the participants and you'll see at the bottom there that you have an opportunity to raise your hand. So we will be using that digital feature when, if you have a question towards the end of the press conference. Your other option, when you hover at the bottom, there should be something that says chat. Um, and you can also send just to myself or to the whole group any questions that you may have for our speakers during the question and answer portion. The last thing I'll say, I think most people have used one of these platforms before. Um, and so you might, you're familiar with the mute and unmute and video mute and unmute. Right now you're all muted, um, but we'll change that where you can unmute yourself for the question and answer portion. You have the option of just doing that um, audio only or with audio and video, up to you. Um, you can also, if you don't wanna unmute your audio at all, you can use the chat box feature that I mentioned before. Um, so if you have any questions or issues that pop up, um, you can use that chat feature and just send a question to me um, and I can help you troubleshoot anything there. So without further ado, I will turn it over to our president and CEO, Betsy Ward, to get things started. Thanks, Lydia, and good afternoon, and thank you all so much for joining us today. So USA Rice is the national organization for the rice industry. We represent farmers, millers, merchants, exporters, and end users of rice across the United States. We also manage the Rice Foundation, which is the research arm of the industry, and helps fund our sustainability efforts and help to fund our sustainability report. I'm very proud to lead an organization that represents all segments of the rice industry, and I've witnessed an agricultural commodity innovate and change what it is doing on the ground to help the environment and provide assurance of a sustainable rice supply for the future. This journey has been happening for many, many years, but today marks an exciting day for the rice industry in the United States. I think this accomplishment slide really tells a powerful story. So over the last 30 years, rice farmers have reduced their water use by half, saw significant de decreases in energy use and greenhouse gas emissions, and greatly enhanced wildlife habitat that often is an indicator of a healthy ecosystem. But as farmers continue to innovate, we know further sustainability gains are coming in key areas across the rice supply chain. And that's really what we're here to talk to you about today. So I'd like to introduce our first uh, speaker this, this afternoon, uh, Charlie Matthews. Charlie is a fourth generation rice farmer in the Sacramento Valley of California, where he farms with his wife, Hillary. Charlie's also a true leader in the rice industry, whether it's on a local, state, or national level. He is currently the chairman of my organization, USA Rice, and he also chairs Farmers Rice Cooperative, which is the largest rice co-op in California. He joins us now from his farm in Maryville, California, so I'll turn it over to Charlie. Thank you, Betsy. As an industry, we produce a food crop that millions of Americans and families across the globe enjoy every day. We care about the land we farm and the people we feed. In addition to producing a quality food crop, the importance of wildlife habitat is ingrained in our industry's culture. 
Fields provide habitat for birds and other creatures during the growing season and in the off months. Here in California, we're even providing habitat for salmon these days. This commitment to wildlife habitat has given us the opportunity to partner with conservation organizations across the rice growing regions, and those partnerships keep pushing our sustainability efforts forward. How we approach the care of the land has a long time horizon. The innovations of our parents and grandparents made a difference for my generation of farmers, and I hope that the innovations of today's rice farmers can make a significant difference in the health of the land and the quality of product that our farm's next generation produces. We have come so far in our industry sustainability journey, but the innovation and work to keep improving has never stopped. In farming, there is always more work to be done, but you always have to stop and enjoy the successes. Today, we celebrate how far we've come as an industry and challenge ourselves to keep innovating to see what we can accomplish. I'll now turn it over to a friend and fellow farmer, Jennifer James. Jennifer is a fourth generation rice farmer in Northeast Arkansas who farms with her father and her husband. Jennifer is the chair of the USA Rice Sustainability Committee and is one of the fiercest advocates for the US rice industry and the good we can do together. So with that, I'll throw it to Jennifer on her farm in Newport, Arkansas. Thank you, Charlie. I'm <clears throat> glad to be here with you today. The picture you see on your screen right now is of my family farm's headquarters operation. As you can see on that sign in the front, we are an Arkansas Century Farm, which means um, my family has owned uh, some, some land, farm land here in Northeast Arkansas for over 100 years. So that's something that we're very proud of. Uh, lived here, went to high school here in this in this county here, and when I left to go to college, I was not coming back. Uh, I was headed out of here. I was going to be a city girl. I went to the University of Arkansas with plans to get a degree in accounting and possibly uh, head on to law school after that and, and live in the city somewhere, but it didn't take me long to figure out that the, the flatlands, the rice fields of eastern Arkansas, uh, were really home to me, and so I called home, and I asked my dad, I, I said, Dad, if I change my major to ag business, do you think that there might be a place for me in our operation, and first of all, he was shocked, so he had to kind of get over that, because he, he never thought that I would be uh, the one that would come home and farm, uh, but he said, sure, we will figure it out, we'll make it work, and so I'm now planting my 27th crop, uh, and trying to work to add value to our operation here in Arkansas. So with that I want to share with you a few reasons why I feel so motivated to, um, to add to our operation and to continually improve here on our farm. So these two guys right here are the one that I'm in the picture with. That's my husband Greg who farms here with us. And the young man is our son, Dylan. He left this fall to attend Arkansas State University uh, with plans to pursue a degree in agriculture. He loves everything there is to love about farming and uh, wants to come back and hopefully contribute to our operation one day. So with his dreams ahead of him, it's even more important for us to make sure that our operation is viable and uh, hopefully he can put up one of those 150 year farms one day during his tenure here on our family farm. The health, of, the health of any farm can be evaluated by looking at the wildlife that call the farm and the surrounding areas home. Since we have begun to intensively manage the, the uh, winter, uh, winter flooding on our farm, um, we have seen an increase in, in spotting of uh, bald eagles and immature bald eagles here. We also have come to love a flock of tundra swans that come back each year, starting with just a few of several years ago, and the flock has increased over time. And so we look forward to that. Not only does the waterfowl provide good opportunities for our family and our friends to gather in community um, for the hunting and the fellowship, but these activities highlight the fact that if you build it, they will come, not just the wildlife, 
but the friends and family and the other opportunities that we have as farmers and conservationists to instill the love of the land to the next generations. So what does all of this mean for our future and the future of the rice industry in the United States? Well, this picture that you see represents many, many things to me. It represents how far we've come in our production practices. The water that you see there is a small reservoir on my family's farm. Actually, the area that we farm in here in Arkansas has uh, groundwater at about 50 feet. So it's very unique to see a reservoir in my area. We also have a large water recycling system where we can reuse our irrigation water. Um, so this is just a testament to the practices of the, the farmers employ. Uh, many of these practices we've been able to uh, install with the help of NRCS cost share programs. Um, and, and it's just a, a great way to show you how seriously uh, that rice farmers are about preserving our natural resources and that we take the obligation to continuously prove, improve our practices very, very seriously. This picture represents uh, the future. And for me, hopefully that young man is the fifth generation to farm on our family farm. My husband and I, along with so many other rice farmers, have a shared obligation to teach our children and all those that we come in contact with the importance of sustainable agriculture. As we look to the next generation, we're challenging ourselves to do more with less, and we wanna push our industry to the next level. So that is why that today the U.S. rice industry is announcing their 2030 sustainability goals, which will lead to continuous improvement in five key environmental areas, land use efficiency, soil loss, greenhouse gas emissions, water use, biodiversity, and energy use. Our goals are to increase the land use efficiency by 10%. Land use efficiency measures how much land in acres is required to grow 100 pounds of brass. As precision technology increases yields, land efficiency will also increase. Decrease soil loss by 8%. Soils that are good for rice production, like heavy clays, do not erode as easily. So reductions can be achieved through land management techniques using laser and satellite technology. We want to de decrease our greenhouse gas emissions and also our water use by 13% for both. Water is the most important resource in our industry. Innovative practices are being used and developed to improve efficiency and reduce overall water use. And many of these new innovative irrigation methods allow the soil to dry down during the season, decreasing both water use and greenhouse gas emissions. We want to decrease our energy use by 10%. Multiple efficiencies from more fuel efficient farm equipment to practices that reduce the amount of irrigation, fertilizer applications and passes either on or over our field will continue to help US rice farmers reduce energy use. Use of solar power and the bioelectricity through burning rice holes will continue to reduce energy use for mills and other production facilities. We also want to increase our biodiversity by 10%. Winter flooded rice fields provide 35% of the food resources for ducks and waterfowl in North America. This is also a way to manage rice straw in a reduced tillage system which is a win-win for both the wildlife and the rice farmer. To develop these goals, our sustainability committee relied heavily on the robust research community of the six land-grant universities across the rice state. So with that, I'll turn it over to my friend, Dr. Steve Linskin, one of the most storied rice researchers in the world. He now serves as the executive director of the Rice Foundation and he'll talk more about the science behind our industry goals and what innovations will make them possible. So I'll throw it to you, Steve, down in Texas. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh, I am Steve Valenskum, and as someone who spent uh, over 35 years in rice research and extension work, I know how important science-based decision-making is in an endeavor such as this, uh, setting sustainability goals. We begin the process, as Jennifer said, by 
setting goals, it was important to me to bring together the rice research community from all six of the major rice producing states. We've got a superb uh, cast of individuals in each of these states uh, that do both research and extension work. And they were very helpful in us as we were putting together these goals uh, from the best available science. We wanted them to be, to challenge the industry to improve, but we also wanted them not to be so unrealistic that they were discouraging to our industry. We developed the goals based on the aggregate U.S. rice production areas, and in some cases, per 100 pounds of rice produced. Uh, so as we report the outcome of the goals or their progress, it will be reported accordingly. Uh, earlier, the U.S. rice industry sustainability report was uh, referred to. This is a report that is available both uh, on the web and, and in hard copies. We were fortunate to get an NRCS grant to help us develop this report. And it is probably the most comprehensive report on sustainability improvements uh, of any agricultural commodity out there, at least that, that I have seen. The data used in that report uh, came from USDA and are tabulated by field and market every year, uh, every four years in their indicator reports. In addition to field and market indicator reports, we have some other mechanisms for measuring improvements towards sustainability goals. Uh, most of the land grant universities that do rice extension and research work develop uh, some very good data on a lot of these metrics, water use, uh, land use efficiency certainly certainly yields. And as far as biodiversity, our wildlife organizations do an excellent job of tracking increase in winter flooded acres, uh, which will impact this diversity metric. So I'm just going to give a few examples of why we think uh, these goals are realistic within the time period that, that we're talking about. Uh, several of these goals are interrelated. Uh, for example, and are very dependent on the yield of rice, as, as Jennifer said. Uh, for example, if we can increase uh, the yield of an acre of rice by a thousand pounds using the same amount of water, the same amount of energy, then that will really impact the, the land use efficiency, the water use, and, and the, the energy use metrics. Uh, we think we've got a very good chance. We've had some very significant yield increases in rice production in the United States over the past really 20 to 25 years. But we think we might not continue to increase at the level that we have increased over, the, over that past period of time. But we, the industry has been developing new varieties for over 100, 100 years today. Uh, plant breeding programs in all of the major rice producing states. Uh, but we do have some new technologies that we think will really facilitate delivering new rice varieties in the future. Uh, we've been looking at the use of marker assisted selection for many years now, but this technology is finally getting to the point where the database is broad enough and the expense has been reduced that just about every rice breeding program is using this technology. And again, this is a means by very early in the breeding process, taking a small piece of leaf tissue, bring it, bringing it into the lab and putting it through laboratory procedures to determine if major genes of interest are actually in that particular line. And if the combinations of genes are not there, the breeder can eliminate that line fairly early in the breeding process. So we think we'll continue to increase yield. Uh, as Jennifer said, the soil loss has the lowest percentage of uh, decrease, and that's simply because rice, when compared to 
all the other row crops, saw loss is not near as big an issue. Uh, the saw types, the way that we keep the fields flooded, and other production practices really minimize saw, saw loss. Above and beyond yield increases, water use decreases. We have some new technologies, uh, one called alternate wetting and drying where the fields are allowed uh, for the water levels to go down to the soil line several times during the growing season. This really reduces by up to 30% the water use in that field. Uh, we also have more and more acres going into what we call row rice or furrow rice. And this is where rice is grown on a bed and the entire field is not kept flooded. But the top of the field, we just maintain sufficient water uh, to, to maximize yield potential. And the bottom of the field, we might use a little, a little flood during most of the production cycle. And this technology also will dramatically decrease water use. So these are just a few of the science-based uh, production practices that we think will facilitate us reaching these goals. And I honestly think that the goals are somewhat, somewhat conservative. But as we mentioned earlier, we, want them, we wanted them to be something that we can feel pretty comfortable that we'll reach during that period of time. Uh, but not such that they would be discouraging to the to the industry. And I do want to note that we created these goals under the assumption that certain regions may be more successful at reaching or exceeding some because of production practices, climate, etc. And we do not intend when we report on success of these goals to compare regional performance and will not report data in a, in a way that would allow anyone to do so. So again, thank you for allowing me to bring some of this information to you today. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Betsy before we get to the Q&A. Great, thank you Steve, Jennifer and Charlie for sharing why these goals are so important uh, for our industry and an important next step for us. As I said earlier, I'm really, really proud of where we've come in the past 30 years and excited as I look to the future and what we can accomplish together. We think these goals We'll be holding ourselves accountable um, for, to keep innovating as we have been, but also challenging ourselves and our peers to think outside the box and to do more on sustainability. So thanks again for joining us. And with that, um, I'm gonna, we're gonna open the floor to questions. I'm gonna let uh, Lydia sort of manage the question and answer period. So thanks again. Great, thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, so now we'll open it up to questions. As I mentioned earlier, you can use the hand raise feature. That should be, um, if you go click on participants, you should be able to raise your hand or if you'd like to put it in the chat box. So um, I'll give you guys a few minutes to get unmuted or raise your hand um, if anybody has questions for the speakers. We have a question come through in the chat box. This is from Lisa Held. Um, Question is, does USA Rice have statistics on how many farmers are currently using methods like alternate wetting and drying and furrow irrigated rice? Steve, do you wanna answer that one? Yes, I'd be happy to. We've got very good information uh, that has developed. Each, each one of the rice states has an extension rice specialist and between the extension rice specialist and every county's uh, extension aid, agent, they are able to develop very accurate information on how many acres uh, are these alternate wetting and drying and, and furrow irrigation are used on. And that information is put together every year. Great. Um, any other questions? I don't see any other raised hands. Um, let's see. And you can also just unmute yourself and ask if that's easier. All right, great. Well, if you think of a question later, um, you can contact my, Michael Klein, who is our Vice President of Communications and Domestic Promotion, or myself. I'd be happy to answer, answer any additional questions for you. Um, we will, the USA Rice Daily will be published at 3.30, and that will be um, the, our press release on this, and um, will kind of be permission for you to 
uh, publish anything you'd like about these goals and what we've presented here today. We'll also be sending you um, a short press kit following this that includes um, more detailed information about the goals, a lot of what um, the, the types of things that Steve presented on, as well as um, speaker bios, some social media information about um, our handles and some images there that you can use, as well as the full sustainability report if you haven't had a chance to read that as well. So thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon um, and have a great rest of your day.